I see, Mr. Brown. This vibration comes in at a definite speed. That's right. It certainly is annoying, so I wish you'd fix it. I don't notice it all the time. Well, we'll road test your car thoroughly, make sure of the cause, and take care of the condition. Fine. I'll wait till I hear from you. And that's why I think it's the universal joints and propeller shaft, Tech. Sounds about right, Mac. I suppose you're going to bring Sandy up to date so he'll learn how to service universal joints. He's going to have to, Tech. When it comes to universal joints, I'm as green as a pepper. Then Mac's your man, all right. He knows this subject like a book. Oh, I don't claim to know all the answers, Sandy. But let me tell you how I road tested this car and analyzed the problem. Swell. What's the first thing you did? Well, I drove the car, increasing the speed until I felt the vibration. It was there, all right. I could feel it with my feet on the floor pan. But I increased the speed, the vibration got worse. I shifted into neutral, and the vibration was still there. I let the car coast down, and below 50, the vibration disappeared. What did all that add up to, Mac? Well, being in neutral, that ruled out engine, clutch, or transmission vibrations. Anyway, those are vibrations you can hear. They're noises. For example, a transmission noise caused by a clutch disc, not performing right, will come in at about 45 on deceleration. It'll disappear by the time the car slows down to 30. Another thing, engine, clutch, and transmission noises are periodic. They come in at a definite speed range and go out again. So I just knew it wasn't any of those. Okay. Where'd that leave you then? Somewhere in the drive line, from the transmission back. Rear axle noise was out because that you can hear. It changes pitch as speed increases. So that narrowed it down to tires, wheels, or the prop shaft assembly. Yeah, but which one, Mac? I wasn't quite sure, so I inflated the tires to 50 pounds and ran the same test again. Now, ordinarily, that overinflation would rule out tire noise or vibration. At least, it eliminates a tire bump possibility. The tire treads were evenly worn, but I ran my hand over all of them, feeling for flat spots. I found none. I checked for mud caked in the wheels, because that can set up an unbalanced condition. But there was no mud. Another thing, while a tire noise is noticed over a longer speed range, and usually gets worse the faster you go, it's got a different, slower beat. You can practically count the vibrations. Well, did you check anything else? Oh, yeah. I checked wheel balance, and it was okay. Anyway, front wheel unbalance you can feel in the steering wheel. Rear wheel unbalance you can feel by the seat of your pants. The car goes forward with a sort of jerky sensation. The vibration I felt was a floor pan tickle. So I'm pretty sure the prop shaft assembly is the guilty party. It all sounds like a real whodunit, Mac. <laughs> I sure felt like Dick Tracy. And the mystery isn't solved yet. Remember that the vibration got worse as the speed increased. Now, some prop shaft vibrations are also felt through the floor pan, but they come in at certain speeds and go out again. A gob of undercoating on the shaft, throwing it out of balance can do that. So can a bent shaft cause periodic vibrations. A trunnion pin not centered in the shaft could also cause a vibration that would come and go. So those are three conditions I've about ruled out. Uh, wish I could be of help, Mac, but I know from nothing about the prop shaft. Well, you know that the prop shaft transmits the engine's driving power to the rear wheels. Yep, that I know. And you know that universal joints are needed because the transmission main shaft and rear axle pinion shaft don't line up. Yeah, the transmission's a lot higher. Right. And what's more, the pinion shaft constantly moves up and down as the rear wheels go over bumps in the road. That does two things. First, it changes the angles through which the universal joints have to operate. Secondly, it changes the distance from the transmission to the rear axle. For example, the prop shaft gets almost horizontal when the rear wheels go up over a bump. The distance between front and rear universal joint flanges become shorter. The joint automatically adjusts itself to this change in distance. Uh, better give me all the details, Mac. Okay. Now, uh, this car uses a ball and trunnion type of universal joint. It consists of a trunnion pin pressed into a ball head on the end of the propeller shaft. The pin is exactly centered in the ball head. On each end of the pin is a ball and roller assembly. 
These assemblies each have a steel, ball-shaped part mounted on roller bearings. In addition, the outer end of the ball has a centering button and spring washer. The button serves as a thrust surface, and with the spring, centers the pin and bearings in the body. The bearings fit into passages in the body of the joint. These passages not only provide the means of transmitting the turning force, but they also serve as raceways for the ball and roller assemblies. I see. These passages let the ball and rollers move back and forth when the distance and angle between the transmission and rear axle change. Right. Between the body and the shaft is a synthetic rubber dust cover with an inner lip to keep the grease in the joint. The outer cover keeps mud and water out of the joint. Better explain the cross and roller type of universal joint, Mac. Yeah, while we're talking about joints, we may as well cover both general types. Some makes use a cross and roller type of universal joint. It's also used on longer wheelbase cars that use a two-piece propeller shaft. Uh, here's a shaft I got out of stock. Notice that the cross-type joint has four bearing journals. Two journals are fitted with a cap-type bushing containing roller bearings. The other two journals are fitted with roller bearings and closed in a bearing block assembly. This block bolts to the companion flange when the joint is assembled to the mating part. Now, to allow for changes in distance between the transmission and the rear axle, this cross joint has one yoke with external splines to mate with internal splines in the prop shaft. In other words, it has a slip joint type of connection. You'll find the splined slip joint at the front end of the propeller shaft, where it's not so vulnerable to road splash. The rear joint isn't splined. Instead, the fixed yoke at the rear of the propeller shaft is bolted to the pinion shaft companion flange. Now, that in turn is held to the pinion shaft by a nut. Now, I see the difference, Mac. Now, what did you mean about a two-piece shaft? Long wheelbase models, like the eight-passenger cars, use a two-piece propeller shaft. You see, the longer a shaft is, the more it might tend to whip at high speed. The two-piece shaft is made up of one shaft from the transmission back to a support bearing and another shaft from the bearing back to the rear axle. Now that means that there's three universal joints, one at the transmission, one at the bearing, and one at the rear axle pinion. I see the difference, Mac. Now, what's causing the vibration on this car? Well, I don't really know yet. Tech and I just put the car on the lift. Yeah, and before you go any farther, Somebody better lift the needle and turn the record over. Now, Sandy, there might be too much looseness in the universal joints or in the flange connections. That could cause a vibration. I see. Anything else? A dry joint or an axle housing out of line can cause a prop shaft vibration, too. I see, Tech. Now, how's the best way to start tracking down the cause of a vibration? Well, it pays to do the easiest ones first. Like checking for looseness, hey, Mac? Right, o Tech. So let's try turning the prop shaft. I already set the handbrake. Now, as I rock the shaft, we can feel and listen for looseness. Well, what's your verdict? Huh? Well, looseness isn't the answer. Let's check rear axle housing alignment. If a spring center bolt is broken, or if the spring U-bolts are loose, the housing might have shifted. Measure from the front edge of the spring seat on the housing to the center of the front hanger bolt on both sides of the car. They should measure the same. Well, they measure the same. That's another thing we can rule out. Oh, by the way, Mac, did you remember to rub your hand along that prop shaft? No, Tech, but I'll do it right now. Nothing here, Tech. <laughs> what did you expect, Mac? A hornet's nest? No. No, I was checking to see if any undercoating or gobs of paint got on the shaft. Even that can set up a vibration. Where's that leave us now? Well, ready for disassembly, Sandy. So let's punch mark the body flange and companion flange. Then we'll be able to get the joints back in their original position. Now, disconnect both universal joints from their companion flanges and remove the prop shaft from the car. And over on the bench, Let's remove the clamps and peel back those dust covers. Uh-oh, look at the grease in here. Yeah, if we'd have suspected grease, we could have checked that on the car. Right. Now, Sandy, grease doesn't belong in the cover. 
It goes over to one side and throws the shaft out of balance. It's probably the cause we've been looking for. Yeah, Mac. Some guys never learn. Some joker must have filled the covers full of grease. How wrong can a guy be? Amen, Tech. I've seen some other mistakes just as bad. For instance, here's a joint body I replaced the other day. I don't know where it's from, but it sure isn't a genuine part. Look how the raceways were split wide open. Lucky thing nobody was hurt. Why anybody would gamble on questionable parts in a spot as important as a universal joint is beyond me. I sure don't want to take chances with my life. You see, Sandy, the joint must be engineered for the car. It's got to be a precision part made from materials that can stand up under torque loads developed by the car it's going to work on. And it's got to be specially processed and hardened. That's because the joint takes a lot of jolts. And it works in the open under all kinds of weather. It's one part you can't gamble with. That new rubber cover has it all over the lace-on leather cover, too, eh, hey, Mac? Yep. The rubber cover has an inner lip, which keeps grease where it belongs. It seals out water and dirt, which could cause a joint to fail. The lace-on type doesn't do as good a job. Now, for instance, the lacing or clips may open up. Then dirt could get through the lap and wear out the joint in a hurry. The rubber cover resists stone cuts better. It also stretches and compresses more without creasing and has a much longer life. Well, you've convinced me, Mac. It's surprising how much thought goes into the design of such a simple part. I'll make sure I use genuine parts. Fine. And remember, never replace a damaged cover without first cleaning, inspecting, and lubricating the joint. Good point. You see, Sandy, when a cover's damaged, dirt and water are apt to be in the joint. Lacing on a leather cover as a quick cure is like bandaging an infection without treating the infection properly. Now, let's disassemble the joints so we can inspect them. When you inspect the parts, look for signs of wear or scoring in the body raceways. Look for brinelling on the rollers or pins, and for wear or scoring on the balls and centering buttons. If the trunnion pin has to be replaced, press it out with an arbor press. Don't drive it out with a hammer. Press in a new pin using this assembly bushing. When the end of the pin is flush with the ground face of the bushing, the pin is properly centered in the ball head. Okay. Now, these parts all look okay to me. Good. Now, uh, before we reassemble, let's install new dust covers. Here's how you do that. Coat the inside and outside of the covers with clean grease to make the installation. Push the body towards the propeller shaft. Then stretch the small end of the dust cover over the pin and ball head and into the body as far as possible. Next, force the cover through the body. Install the small end over the flange of the prop shaft and secure it with the short clamp. When you work the large end of the cover over the body flange, be sure the inner lip is pointing toward the ball end of the shaft. Then install the clamp with the bolt directly opposite the bolt in the other clamp. For safety's sake, Cut off the ends of the bolts near the nuts. Right. Now we're ready to lubricate the rollers and assemble all the parts. You want to be sure to install the washers and the button springs. Then you put one and one quarter ounces of universal joint grease in the body. Hold it, Mac. That lubrication is mighty important. An ounce and a quarter of grease is a wad just a hair smaller than this golf ball. You got to be sure to divide the grease so you get the same amount in each raceway. Tech's right, Sandy. If you use more than the one and one quarter ounces specified, grease might be forced into the cover. And be sure to use universal joint grease. This heavy fiber grease has a high melting point. It stays in the raceways. It won't flow from one to the other, throwing the joint out of balance and leaving one side dry. Okay, Mac. Good. Now let's assemble the joints using new gaskets properly positioned under the grease covers. Incidentally, if we hadn't found our trouble in the joint or the prop shaft, we would have had to check the companion flanges for runout. Excessive runout can also cause a vibration. How much runout can you allow, Mac? Well, runout at the outer edges of the transmission and rear axle flanges should not exceed seven thousandths. I see, Mac. Now, what's next? Next, install the shaft. Be sure to line up the punch marks. 
And don't turn the shaft end for end. That might bring in a vibration you didn't have before. Okay, will do. And tighten those flange bolts 33 to 37 foot-pounds to keep grease from leaking across the gasket face. Right, Otec. Now, Mac, does that just about cover universal joint and prop shaft servicing? As far as this job's concerned, yes. But we haven't talked much about the cross and roller type of joint. Well, that's okay, Mac. This reference book has the complete story of both types of universal joints. Swell. I can sure use that book, Tech. But Mac certainly did a thorough job, right? That's true, my boy. And if you go at every universal joint job just as thoroughly, you're going to get yourself a lot of service business. Yeah, Tech. So keep this in mind, Sandy. Our service reputation is at stake on every service job we do. Right. That's why you got to remember that you're not going to do yourself or your customers a favor by using cheap, non-standard parts or by doing a halfway job of service.